Welcome to Rock Center Shorts. My name is Mike Callahan. I'm the Executive Director of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance here at Stanford Law School, and I'm delighted to welcome back a return player as a guest today. My colleague, Nate Persley, is the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law here at Stanford Law School and the co-director of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, the Stanford Program on Democracy and the Internet, and the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project. Thanks, Nate, for coming back to Rock Center Shorts. Thanks for having me back. So there's been so much in the news the last few years about social media companies and disinformation, the recent Facebook whistleblower testimony and the Facebook files and the Wall Street Journal reporting have taken that to a whole new level. Uh, you've been working in this area for a long time. You recently testified to the US Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs on a related part of this topic. And we'd love to get your views on this. And I wanna start with, offering you an opportunity to describe your proposed Platform Transparency and Accountability Act, uh, which takes an approach at, at how we can, as a society can move forward in this area. Sure, well, thanks for that. Uh, and thanks for having me back. Let me just start by saying that um, I think we've reached an inflection point with these disclosures by Frances Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower. Uh, it's not just what she disclosed, but it's the fact that she disclosed it and that she mm -hmm. revealed all of the kind of data and research that's going on at Facebook uh, and sort of taught us how much Facebook knows about us and how little we know about them. Uh, and the idea behind federal legislation to force companies to uh, open up their data outside research is it has several advantages. Uh, the first is the mere fact that the outside, outside researchers would get access to the internal data would I think change company behavior because they would know that they're being watched. But beyond that, and this is something I think that I would hope the platforms would appreciate, is that um, you know, it will make for sounder public policy if we actually know what is really going on on these platforms. There's a lot of conventional wisdom out there about say the role of algorithms and social harms they create, um, but we really, there, there's a, you know, a big disagreement to, about that and we really need the internal data to do that. So the, so the legislation I proposed would empower the FTC to compel the largest platforms, mainly Facebook and Google, but probably also Twitter and TikTok, to share data with outside researchers in a safe, secure, privacy protected way where the data would still reside at the firm, but that outsiders who would not be vetted by Facebook, but would be vetted by either the FTC or the, the National Science Foundation would then um, um, have research proposals that would be approved so that they can do research on the platform. And so the key question here is always about protecting user privacy. So there's a lot of um, sort of thought that goes into that to make sure that researchers are nested in legal relationships so that we don't repeat another Cambridge Analytica. But the basic idea is that outsiders not beholden to the profit maximizing mission of the firm will have access to the same data that the internal researchers would. And when they get access to that research, what, what sort of research are you envisioning that would help inform better policy? Are there particular approaches that, that you think should be taken here and, or areas that, are, that should be focused on? Or is it well, that let, not a specific yeah. where the act goes? Yeah, let's just start with the role of algorithms in, in organizing news feeds and the like, right? So there, there is, if you listen to Francis Haugen, if you listen to conventional wisdom, the basic argument is that the algorithms at, at YouTube and at Facebook and maybe Twitter are leading people down rabbit holes, that they're feeding people salacious and, and extreme information, and it's causing polarization and the like. The, the platforms completely disagree with that. They say that the opposite, if anything, is true. So that is an empirical question that is easily answerable if you have the internal data. The problem is those of us on the outside really can't test those hypotheses. It's only the folks on the inside and no one trusts them. So that's just like an example of, of, of the kind of research that needs to be done. But I think that you know once, once we sort of set this up, everything from foreign election manipulation to um, you know, the effect of Instagram on teen girls' health to um, COVID disinformation is in scope, right? I mean, all of these issues are, um, you know, all of these pathologies of modern day life are being attributed to social media. And if we have the data, we can better understand whether that's true or not. And so the, the act wouldn't prescribe a certain kind of research. The researchers would be allowed to do uh, things that they think would be beneficial or inform the public dialogue. Do the platforms have to agree in the rubric you proposed or does that, it's open to the researchers? 
they have no choice in the matter. So the FTC and the NSF would vet research projects and researchers to decide to make sure that you don't have any, um, you know, Russian spies who are coming in to, to camp out at Facebook. Uh, and so, uh, and, and this would be under familiar protocols that we have for other kinds of research grants with the National Science Foundation. So that I don't think we're kind of reinventing the wheel there. Uh, and that, but the key thing is that Facebook cannot choose its researchers, right? So, so outsiders, uh, sometimes with adversarial sort of views uh, on social media, would be able to, to have access to Facebook data. Now, they would not be able to take the data outside of Facebook, right? Anything that goes out of the firm would have to be reviewed for privacy uh, violations and the like, because we want to prevent another Cambridge Analytica. But, um, but, but the key feature here is that Facebook would have, or Google or whoever else, would not have any role in choosing the researchers or the research projects. And why do you think university affiliation or university researcher is the way to go here versus there's other organizations that you could focus on or that the FTC could focus on? What makes that uh, unique? So I would love to expand this beyond university researchers, but I just don't know how, frankly, mm -hmm. um, because I know what a university is and I know what an academic or a professor is. Now, yes, there are sort of Prager University and University of Phoenix out there, but we deal with that in government grants all the time. The problem is, you know, if we open this up to journalists and think tanks, I don't know how to legally define what those entities are. Um, and, you know, and because, you know, if you just start saying journalists, then, then how do you distinguish Breitbart from the New York Times? If it's think tanks, you know, what, you know, someone who, who just develops a think tank on a given day, how are they different than the Brookings Institution? And so, you know, intellectually, I can, I can distinguish among those, but um, I, I can't figure out how to write that into the statute. So I hope others will. <laughs> but starting with a defined set, I mean, universities have standards on research and other things that people are familiar with. So I guess that that's a good way to start. Part of the reason also to start with researchers is that they are nested in legal relationships with the universities. And so the mm -hmm. way that I envision this is that the universities would also be signatories to data access agreements in addition to the to their employees, the professors oh, who are part of it. And so, they, you know, they, part of this is it to, to, to everybody will be nested in these legal relationships so that if someone tries to go rogue, that there will be serious prices to pay, the academics would lose their jobs, potentially criminal penalties and the like. And so, you know, we have to be very serious, especially at the front end about the privacy considerations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so following your testimony uh, at the committee a couple, a week or so ago, where do things sit now and, and what do you think is gonna happen next in Congress? Well, I'm happy to say that Senator Portman announced actually at the hearing that he and Senator Coons are working on a version of this legislation based off the draft that I put out there. And I'm hopeful that that'll um, be made public in the next month or so. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of interest uh, on Capitol Hill. I talked with, I don't know, four to six Senate staffs uh, mm -hmm. when, when I was there. Um, I think there's also, what will be interesting is if the FTC gets involved, because on the one hand, because uh, that's the way I envision this, mm -hmm. you could see a scenario with all these investigations that the FTC is doing that as part of, say, a consent decree that flows out of those uh, investigations, you actually could have some kind of transparency protocol that would be put in place, even without federal legislation. But I think mm -hmm. most people think that this is the lowest of low hanging fruit is transparency legislation. It doesn't trigger some of the partisan polarization that we get on other tech regulations. Well, congrats on getting that kind of progress uh, in terms of where it goes uh, inside of that committee and, and what might happen in the future. So that my next question relates to how the community of, of industry participants is going to react. So general counsels, board members, CEOs, they're going to be asked, maybe already have been asked to sort of evaluate, make recommendations on, and whether they would support your proposed act. So why should they get on board with your recommendations? Well, to some extent, I don't want their endorsement because that's the thing that would sink it. But, but leaving that, um, I think that, you know, if you are working in one of these companies right now, you are potentially on the receiving end of any number of legislative proposals uh, to regulate tech, everything from content moderation to antitrust to privacy and the like. Uh, transparency seems to me to be like, not only is it a, a condition, uh, you know, prerequisite, for smart legislation in these areas. But I think that it, it, it's one that, you know, that, look, I know that people inside the firms, there are people inside the firms who are supporting me in this, right? But these are the people who are vested on, on, in academic research. Um, 
I, I think, you know, regulation is coming. Uh, this seems to me to be the, the, uh, the least of it, right? It's the first step, which will allow us all to learn and craft better public policy, both in the US and abroad. Uh, as with all things tech regulation, um, part of the question is whether the US or the Europeans are gonna be first movers here, because I think it's likely that pursuant to the Digital Services Act that they will uh, do a compelled data sharing program as well. Interesting. Well, I think you know your pitch on transparency and, and the fact that regulation is coming and hard to oppose something that focuses on transparency first. I think that's compelling and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of dialogue in the community. And I want to really thank you for taking the time to come and talk to us. It's a fascinating proposal uh, and I look forward to seeing how it plays out. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks for joining us at Rock Center Shorts. Thanks.